Welcome everybody to the Youth Engagement and Adult Allyship in Health panelist discussion. Panelists, you can feel free to turn your videos on if you'd like. Also feel free to keep them off. I know having your camera on can be a little bit exhausting sometimes. Dale, do you think we're maybe ready to get started? Yes, we are ready. Okay, awesome. So just a few um, housekeeping reminders before we get into it. Um, the session is being recorded, um, but just so you know, if you were just an attendee watching the presentation, um, you don't have video or microphone, so you don't have to worry about that, but the chat box, the Q&A box will be recorded as well as the panelists um, who are speaking. Uh, panelists, please just remember to turn off your mics when you are not speaking. Uh, and then please use the Q&A box or the chat box if you have any questions for the panelists or are having technical problems of any kind. So we're going to start off by introducing all of the panelists. So when I bring up your slide, just feel free to unmute yourself and just introduce yourself. You can say whatever you like. We'll start with Natalia. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Natalia Mason. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator at Saskatoon Sexual Health. Um, we're a local nonprofit organization that offers sexual and reproductive health care services. And uh, most of my experiences that I'll be talking about today have to do with a project uh, that we operate in conjunction with Out Saskatoon called the Shout Project, which is a um, intervention prevention program for trans and two-spirit youth uh, focused on sexual health. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Natalia. And Maria, Mariah, sorry. Good morning. Can you hear me and see me? I can't yes. see myself for whatever reason here. Am I upside down? Uh, we can't see you, but I can hear you. Oh, okay. I'm not sure why that's not working, but good morning, everyone. My name is Mariah Walker. I am a community program officer with the Saskatchewan RCMP, currently posted here in Meadow Lake and have been working in the North uh, my entire career with the RCMP for about 10 years now. I, um, through my role with the RCMP, work in a crime prevention, crime reduction capacity and primarily working with youth in our community. So I'm really excited to be here today and thank you so much for having me. Wonderful, we are so excited to have you here as well. And Adrian. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm uh, honored to be a part of this panel. And yes, uh, my name is Adrian. Um, I'm from, I'm the Youth and Student Coordinator here at uh, Truly Alive Youth and Family Foundation. So we're a nonprofit uh, registered charity that serves vulnerable populations, uh, visible minorities, and newcomers. Um, and so my role in leading the youth and student department is very, is very much coordinating the programs, um, of course, associated with youth, developing those uh, um, or scanning the community to see what needs need to be filled and sort of developing the solutions um, uh, after that. And so, um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm just in general, I'm very passionate just about youth leadership and um, placing more youth in positions of leadership uh, starting today because the, um, as, as our Anthony, our executive director has to say, um, you, they won't get to the, build that future tomorrow if they don't start today. So um, that's a bit about me, thank you. Wonderful, Adrian, we're so glad to have you here. And Shane, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to, uh, you know, uh, my, my given name is uh, uh, Muskwa Ganiganit, and that roughly translates to Bear Man Who Leads. And the names that my parents gave me is Shane Nathan Wesley Bird. I'm a proud Nihi though of the Treaty 6 uh, territory, and I'm from Lac La Ronge Indian Band. And uh, currently, um, I'm contracted out through La Grange Indian Health Band Health Services as a land-based uh, coordinator and new support worker. Um, I uh, help run uh, a youth group called Indigenous Spirits. It's uh, 
to help youth uh, reclaim their identity through the language, culture, and traditions. And um, yeah, that's uh, that's me. Wonderful. We're so glad to have you here today. And Chris. Hi, everybody. I'm very honored to be asked to be a part of this panel. Um, my name is Chris Helkett. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am currently on a leave, um, completing my Bachelor of Social Work, but I work with Pewop and Women's Center um, as a family violence outreach support worker. And my role is to support families who are experiencing violence. And a part of that, I was um, also involved in a group called the Squeezes Club that is for young women and girls um, or those who identify as such. Um, and it is a support program. So um, I'm excited to be here today. We are so glad to have you here, Chris. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Nikaela Lang. I am the Youth Action for Prevention Coordinator at the Saskatchewan Prevention Institute. Um, I'm currently living in Saskatoon uh, on Treaty 6 territory. I've only been in this role for about a month now, so I'm new and kind of just figuring out as I go. Um, and Dale, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Nikaela. Hi, everybody. My name is Dale Apsis. I'm the Northern Youth Action for Prevention Coordinator. I, too, is uh, fairly new to the organization. I started with the organization back in August of 2021. So I am great to, to be part of the organization and to work in a capacity that works with youth and works with professionals across the province with parents and communities, too, as well, that work directly with youth. And I just want to acknowledge to all of the uh, panelists who are joining us, joining us this morning from all the different treaty territories and Indigenous lands across Saskatchewan. So in, in terms of our NALIC land acknowledgement uh, to honor those, those, uh, those places and spaces that, uh, that occupy Indigenous peoples. So once again, thank you uh, to, our, to our participants who are joining in joining in with us today uh, in this, this morning. So if you have any questions uh, that you are like to directly to ask the panelists. Uh, so we have um, about eight questions that we're going to be discussing today. I'll bring them up on the screen. I'll read them. Um, the way that I found best to do this over Zoom is once I read the question, I will say, okay, Chris, do you want to maybe expand on that? And then after Chris has spoken, Chris might say, okay, Shane, what do you think? And just kind of go that way. That makes sure that everyone has a chance to talk, but we're also not talking over one another. Of course, panelists, if you don't like the question, just say pass. I don't want to talk about that. Uh, and we will respect that. Okay, so the first question that I'd like to talk about today is um, in your in your respective roles, what are your best practices with engaging with youth during this global pandemic that we're still living through within your own capacities and roles? And I guess, Adrian, maybe I'll start with you because you're at the very top of my screen. Uh, for sure, yes, uh, a fantastic question. I'll be glad to start us off. Um, so yeah, I started my, I started this role and I guess uh, working in the sector in May of uh, last year so um yes not not that much experience and still very still feeling very much like i'm um feeling the ropes but it was a unique experience at least for me that i've only ever known this during pandemic times and so i don't really have that contrast with pre-pandemic times but i'll speak to i suppose like the challenges that um that did arise from that and so just in general i think it's understandably harder um, as as the fellow panelists would know, to make an impact on young people's lives when you're at a distance, and so even having just like for example like a webinar versus having like a physical face-to-face -face roundtable discussion, even if you're talking about the same things, uh, you can produce very different outcomes just from having that presence uh, there. And so, um, two ways that I can see 
um, well, here, here at Truly Lab that we've done to kind of minimize that distance is first, <clears throat> uh, whenever possible, we try to emphasize that, uh, you know, with, with uh, consideration for our client's safety and their comfort, wherever it's possible, we want to offer them to, oh, I'm sorry. sorry about that. We want to offer that they're, uh, <clears throat> uh, they can come to see us face to face because we still do have in-person services available. Um, is trying to explore and meet them where they're at um, and basically just make them uh, the feeling that you know, we're there for them and that we were able to kind of cross that distance if they, if they so wish. Um, of course, when that's not possible and we have to remain distant, we, um, one thing I've, been, um, I've tried to do is try to keep like digital interaction as lighthearted as possible and just try to be empathetic in the sense that um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these uh, the youth I engage with have online school all day. They're sitting in front of a screen. They're probably some of them maybe interacting with most of their friends through things like Discord and stuff like that. And so, so much of their time is just on the screen that uh, kind of want to be kind and not want to add on to all that all that screen stress. And so, try to make it as as easygoing, as lighthearted as possible. Um, not drag it on for too long and just be as helpful and as efficient as possible. So um, uh, I hope that was a, yeah, that made sense. And then Adrian, if you'd like to maybe pass it off to another panelist. Yes, um, uh, pass it off to Shane, please. So uh, what are my best practices with engaging with youth during the global pandemic within uh, my capacities and roles? So um, when, I, when I worked in the schools, um, you know, we, were, we all had to be, you know, um, safe and uh, some days we'd have to do uh, uh, rapid test at the beginning of the week. Um, you know, my, my office would be full of full, full of youth and, uh, you know, we'd have to limit that to, um, you know, four, four kids in my office at a time. Um, but we also made a, you know, a, a safe guideline chart to follow um, so that I'd be able to work with uh, four youth outside the school. Um, you know, being able to accommodate that it, it was pretty tough because, uh, you know, we all wanted to be close um, and be able to, you know, interact um, more because I do a lot of land base with youth and a lot of uh, ceremonial um, base uh, stuff with youth as well. Um, so I used a lot of uh, social media, like Facebook Messenger, video chats. Um, sometimes we'd use uh, it with teams to, to, to connect with youth. Um, so uh, we were able to connect that way. Um, also like, you know, if, if there was a youth in crisis, you know, I would be right at their doorstep or wherever they were and I would pick them up and I'd bring them to the house. And, um, you know, my, my house is a safe place for kids. It's, it's open, you know, uh, for everyone and my family and, uh, for all the youth that I work with, and they all know that uh, whenever they they need uh, a place to come, you know, they, they come to my place. And uh, myself and my wife, uh, we talk to the kids, we work with the kids one-on-one, uh, -on -one and, um, you know, we we feed them. We, we, uh, we do have a safe place, you know, at uh, our house as well. So, um, but with the COVID pandemic, uh, you know, it's it's about keeping everyone safe, and you know, um, with having those rapid tests, it, it it has helped us a lot to to keep my family safe. And you know, if if a young young person did come over, we we do a, a rapid test just to be safe, right? And taking those precautions. So yeah, um, I think that's it for for that question for me, and I'll. Uh, Pass it on to uh, Chris. 
Thank you for that, Jane. Um, so when I started my role, um, I had just, I began in October and then we had a lockdown again, not too long after that. So I really started my role in the midst of a lockdown. Um, so trying to engage youth was really challenging, um, trying to figure out ways to engage them. So I really learned how to use Snapchat, um, different kinds of social media platforms, um, also different types of games on social media, like Cahoots. I'm pretty sure everybody knows what that is now. Um, but meeting kids where they're at was really important. So I think just um, that's what I would say is best practice moving forward, whether we're in a pandemic or not, is just meeting kids where they're at and treating them the way you would a friend or, you know, another adult, um, because they are human and they just have uh, different experiences. So I think that would be my best uh, practice. And I will pass it over to um, Maria. I agree with what you said there, Chris. I think um, recognizing that everyone is doing the best that they can to get through and all of the challenges that they're experiencing as youth are compounded with the restrictions of lockdowns and COVID pandemics, et cetera, is really important to recognize. Um, I was fortunate during the pandemic to be able to still work in the schools, which was really helpful in being able to maintain that face-to-face -face contact that I know that some of our kids really needed. In addition to that, obviously, you know, having them on Snapchat and, and connecting with them on platforms that they're using was something that I had to navigate. I never felt more old in my life than trying to, to start getting in the lingo and understanding what some of these um, apps were that they were using so that I could stay connected with them. The other thing that I noticed is just doing roundtable check-ins when we first met, you know, hey, how are you doing? What's going on in your life these days? Tell me something positive that happened this week. I think the kids really benefited from just, you know, connecting and being able to share where they were and feeling like they were heard and validated. Um, that was a huge piece for me as well um, that I found really worked. And then obviously being able to be there in the schools and connecting with them um, made it that much easier for them to come forward with the other things that they needed uh, help more in a more professional capacity as well. So. I believe the only other person left, I think, is Natalia. So I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll also emphasize connecting um, with young people. When we first started the Shout Project, we were trying to establish a um, kind of method of contacting, <laughs> contacting the participants. And I remember saying to them, like, can we text you? And they were like, nope. And <laughs> we were like, can we email you? And they were like, nope. And we were like, how can like how can we stay connected here? And they were like, Snapchat. And we were like, that's it, just Snapchat. And they said, yeah, just Snapchat. So we said, okay. And um, our program has used Snapchat for the last five years. And there's been some pushback sometimes from the funders um, in terms of using Snapchat to connect with them. But we've always just advocated for being able to communicate with them in the way that they find um, easiest and most comfortable. So um, continuing to utilize those kinds of um, programs or whatever has been really beneficial to us. I think that the other thing that really stands out for me is just that our expectations had to change during the pandemic. Um, the Shout Project is a five-year project that's funded by the Government of Canada. Um, and so we've obviously got some pretty specific objectives that we are tied to, as well as outcomes. And those things just weren't necessarily achievable during the pandemic. Um, our youth advisory team typically meets once a month, and that just wasn't something that was viable in March of 2020. And so there's definitely just been a lot of adjusting um, our expectations to meet the youth where they are um, in terms of like their own capacity. They all had lots of things going on in their personal lives and their academic lives. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that any programming that we were offering was of benefit to them, that it wasn't burdening them in any way. So we've also just tried to stay really flexible um, to make sure that they know that 
they are welcome back to the program at any point in time. So even if we haven't seen them for six months or two years, that they are welcome to come back and join us. Um, and the other thing that I would just say in terms of best practices, and I like to mention this whenever I can, um, is just that we compensate them for their time. Um, and because the pandemic has made it harder for them to engage, um, we've offered more compensation. So um, they're paid for each meeting that they attend. Uh, right now we're giving them credits for skip the dishes because we would normally do food, but we're not in person, so we can't do that. Um, they're also being compensated a little bit more to help on a specific project that we have that requires a little bit more initiative from them. Um, so just ensuring that we are also recognizing the experience um, and the expertise that they bring to their roles in the program. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Is there any like final notes or anything anyone wants to say about what any of the other panelists said before we move on? Maybe not. Okay, we'll go on to question number two. Um, so question number two says, what are some of the challenges that youth are facing in your specific community and how are youth overcoming these challenges? Uh, and maybe I will start with Adrian again. Uh, yeah, so I'd say far and away, the uh, number one group of issues and challenges that I've encountered <clears throat> uh, with, with our youth clients has been mental health uh, related challenges. And um, so it's a very big umbrella, but I guess under that broad term, um, I found it's, it, it centers on, on these on five things. It's uh, mental health challenges from arising from isolation. Um, these are challenges arising from like the disruption, just normal habits, all, all in the context of the pandemic. I mean, um, there's also a lot of anxiety and um, it's more of like the anxiety that um, just kind of settles beneath the surface. So a lot of worries about that, like, for example, poor performance in school or perceived poor performance just because um, I've noticed that um, how youth like measure their performances or their benchmarks hasn't exactly adapted yet to like the new normal, right? There's uh, there's a lot of this idea that, yeah, I used to be able to do this before, I'm not now, there's something wrong with me. Um, there's also just been intensified just like feelings of loneliness, like both in like a social sense and also just that feeling that these problems they're facing are like there's alone, and um, you know you can imagine that comes from not being able to connect with their with their peers and and see that they are very much experiencing this this thing collectively. Um, I'd say the last one is basically just the general feeling of like uncertainty about the future. This idea that there's a lot of bleakness coming and there's not a lot to I guess look forward to. And so um, how they're overcoming those challenges? Well, I'd say that it's um, you know. It's thrown out a lot, and we know for sure that youth are resilient, and and I and I, I see that every day in in the in the folks I meet. But also, I'm wary not to over to kind of beat that saying too much because um, it's not wise to to rely too much on that resilience because um, youth are in a very fragile point in their lives. On on I mean, just just on their own, not not even considering what's happening, and so. Um, I found that there's a lot of like when I when I hear anecdotes when I hear stories, um, there's a lot of stories of standing back up again, and um, the feeling that at the time they they there's not the sense that I know I can I can come out of this, but looking back, um, there's that realization that oh yeah you know I was I was able to overcome it I was I was more um, resi resilient than I thought, and so. I guess in short, I'll say that it's it's a it's an ongoing process of just figuring out how to find um, the point of balance in in this new reality we're living in, and so a lot of learning, a lot of falling down, but most importantly, a lot of getting back up. Um, and I'd like to pass it off to Natalia, please. No well, thanks. Um, I saw that there was a question in the Q and A that I'll maybe just answer. Um, that said, are Canadian schools virtual only? Um, and no, they're not. I think for the most part, students are back in classrooms. Um, they would have started the September in classrooms. Um, 
I think they were actually in school like from January until June probably last year as well. So um, there has been kind of just like a blend throughout the pandemic. And um, I think that classrooms are also kind of impacted just by how many students are well enough to be in school. So I've been in a few classrooms over the past couple of weeks and some of them have had like fewer than a quarter of the students present um, just because people are homesick or isolating, whatever it might be. So. Um, I think I would just echo the sentiment around some mental health challenges. Our program isn't something that young people are engaging with super consistently um, in terms of the youth advisory team, just because they only meet once a month. So we don't necessarily see um, that same kind of consistency, consistency with our youth participants. Um, but I know that out Saskatoon operates some other youth groups and Right now, for example, they're, they're all virtual. And so there's certainly been some decreased engagement uh, just because I think that young people are having a hard time with how much screen time is kind of expected of them. Um, and it can be really challenging to like build relationships that way. Um, so I just often you know, think about the fact that like some of the students that are in school right now, especially for high school students, the majority of their experience in high school um, has been through a pandemic. And that shapes like the kinds of activities that are available to them, the ways that they're able to participate in programs. Um, so I think that there's also just kind of some general disappointment around um, the experiences that they might be missing out on or not being able to have. And I will pass it off to Chris. Thank you. I totally agree with you. I think that the lack of programs um, really makes you feel like disappointed because it's just another thing that they have to give up. Um, those, you know, events where, or trips that you get to go to because of basketball or volleyball or whatever um, sport that you're involved in at school being canceled constantly because there's an outbreak or something is really difficult and disappointing. And then they have to navigate that. Um, and sorry, and often people are, um, you know, we have to try and move away from saying, oh, it's just, you know, it's a pandemic, it's, you, you're, you'll be fine. Um, and not validating those experiences um, and those challenges. So I think just constantly being disappointed of the things that they have to give up is a challenge that youth are facing. Um, there's also the fact that they have to, oh, this person just really needs to get a hold of me. Um, <laughs> but there's the other side of that too. It, there's another challenge that they're having to, especially, um, okay. Okay, I think they're done. Especially if they are, um, when when it was online, when everybody had to go online because the schools were closed, then youths were having to stay home when they didn't really want to be there, especially if it was not a safe home. Um, so, you know, not really any place to go and who to reach out to was another challenge for them. So I think um, getting back to schools was really good because then they, you know, those issues became more relevant and highlighted and um the adults in their lives were now saying hey like this is a problem we need to figure out ways where you can safely reach out um you know through texting or through um different means of reaching out so providing youth with more resources in order to reach out is i think part of helping that them overcome those challenges and I will pass it on to um, Shane. Uh, thank you, Chris, and oh, for for your wise words and uh, for sharing. Um, so some of the challenges that I've seen, you know, uh, for the youth that uh, have been going through in our community, you know, is uh, a lot of uh, homelessness, you know, and you know, with and also with sports and recreation that was being down, you know, a lot of young people were 
were uh, active in sports and recreation. And once that shut down, it, it uh, caused a lot of uh, mental health problems and a lot of uh, you know, addictions as well. And, um, you know, we're, we're kind of lacking supports in our, our region, um, you know, with uh, with uh, youth support programs, you know, to be able to identify the needs for, for our youth and, um, you know, because we're, what the programs that we have now, you know, um, we're only covering a fraction of, of the youth that uh, are in our communities. So, um, you know, it's like we're, we're in crisis mode every day, you know, up here and, you know, it's been like that for years. And even when I was growing up, it, the same things are happening, you know, uh, um, gangs are, are getting more heavily active in our community. Um, the young, young men and young women are, are joining these gangs and, um, you know, it's because we don't have uh, safe homes for these kids, a safe place that's open 24 seven for these kids, um, you know, and, and it's, it's tough, you know, um, being, uh, being someone in my position and wanting to, to help, you know, um, the youth more and more. And I'm trying to figure out different ways, what can I do, you know, to, to help the young people, to encourage them to, to stray away from that, uh, you know, that, that way of life is, is, is uh, challenging, right? And, you know, but there's, uh, since the pandemic started, it, it just went from, you know, we were, we were, we were doing good. And then all of a sudden, boom, the pandemic and, you know, everyone was scared. And, uh, so the programming were, you know, uh, were shut down and a lot of, uh, programs weren't allowed to to work one-on-one -on -one with you so, so it uh it really uh did a number you know in our community and so um how are the youth overcoming you know these challenges is uh you know now that um you know things are kind of letting up up here in the north and uh the programmings are, are starting back up uh you know, I see a lot of, you know, resilience and uh, courage and, you know, and the kids having hope. And, um, you know, like I do meetings at my house with the kids and I invite kids over and, um, you know, they, they want to be able to, to go out on the land and they want to be able to lead the community, you know, because a lot of our, our young people, they don't get that chance to, you know, to, to go out of town, even, you know, to go on trips, um, you know, and I'm talking about the ones that aren't in sports or aren't in recreation, right, and um, our, our high risk needs kids, and, um, you know, that's, those are the ones that um, are stuck in our communities, and so, um, yeah, I think uh, the kids are being resilient now and they're wanting to to overcome the challenges of the pandemic. And, um, but yeah, um, I guess I'll pass it over to um, Adrian or Adrian. So I have already, um, I've already gone, yeah. Yeah, maybe I think we haven't maybe heard from Mariah yet on this one. Hey, um, I think everyone shared some really great examples and touched on a lot of the um, challenges and issues that our youth are facing in communities. Uh, certainly with the closure of schools for those that were attending because so many of our youth um, access programs and services through the school system, whether that's counseling, uh, nutrition programs, and all those things that um, they needed for that support, uh, maybe no longer had access to. 
um, access to community-based services obviously changed significantly with either them being non-existent or moving virtual and then creating other barriers such as, you know, do you have the opportunity or the space at home to be able to connect virtually? Because not, it's not something that all of our families have access to with internet, Wi-Fi devices to be able to connect. Um, I have definitely seen since the pandemic started uh, a rise, especially in Northern Saskatchewan with gangs, um, gang involvement, recruitment, and obviously when our youth are not in school, they're not connected to recreational programs, strong support systems, all those other things that are protective factors for gang involvement. That has certainly been on a rise um, with respect to violent crimes, uh, firearms usage, and all those other stats that the RCMP likes to run and that we're made aware of. Um, so certainly those pieces are highlighted significantly in the Meadow Lake region and especially up through the north um, and echoing a lot of what Shane said. Um, you know, the pandemic has has really disconnected us from one another in a lot of ways. Simply not even being able to see a smile has a significant impact on someone's day. We, um, you know, those pieces are huge. You know, we're lacking that physical touch and hugging and connecting with one another. Um, and sometimes those things are exactly what a youth needs is just to feel loved and safe. Um, so yeah, I think everyone shared some really great examples and really great um, feedback and experience. Awesome, thank you everyone. Any final words, final thoughts before I move on? Okay, so question number three. How do you create a safe space with the youth that you engage with, whatever way that means to you? And maybe I'll start with Natalia this time. Um, I think that the main thing that we kind of focus on is the fact that our program is youth led. Um, so typically what that means is that the youth are the ones who are determining the direction of our programming. Um, I've also never, really been one to stick um, super tight to a script of what I think is supposed to happen for our meetings. So um, if we go completely off topic or off task, like there's no problem with that from my perspective. Um, this is kind of related to a separate experience, but I'm also a girl guide leader. Um, and so we have our weekly meetings and that's just been impossible um, throughout the pandemic. And I've got kids that are seven and kids that are 12 and like that's a really big age difference. And so whatever they want to do when we're online is fine by me. And sometimes I swear they're just typing nonsense words into the chat and listing different kinds of fried chicken. And that's fine with me because they obviously need to do that and want to just engage with their friends in a way that's silly and they don't get that time um, to do that, especially when they were all like at home all day long. And you know, that probably wasn't happening as much at school. So I think that just making the space there um, and trying to lord over it as some kind of boss with an agenda is one of the ways that we do that. Um, the Shout Project, as I mentioned before, is for um, trans and two-spirit youth, and there's a particular focus on youth who are hard to reach, so youth who might traditionally be dis disengaged from a school system um, or from any other system for that matter. So um, I think that the safe space piece has always been a priority for this particular project, and um, for a lot of young people being able to come to programs where there are other people who kind of understand their experience with either their sexual orientation or their identity, whatever that might be, lived experience um, is one of the benefits of this pro um, project existing. And so um, making sure that we were kind of continuing to offer programming, regardless of how many people were able to attend, um, was one way of making sure that they still had um, a safe space that they could continue to access. Um, and I'll pass it to Shane. Uh, thank you, Natalia. Um, so uh, when I, last year when I worked in the schools, um, the safe places would be my office, my offices. So um, I had a office on reserve at a high school and then off reserve at a high school. So I, uh, um, Everything that was done in my office, um, um, it was it was from the kids, right, from the youth. Um, so I made them, you know, help paint, um, figure out what we need, you know, to to create that safe place for them. Um, you know, setting up a smudging table, um, 
having drums there, you know, be able for them to be able to sing if they want to, um, having coffee, you know, snacks and microwaves and, you know, tea ready for them whenever they're hungry in the mornings or, you know, just being able to provide the, the necessary things they need to, to live, right? And it could be clothing, toothbrushes, you know, um, toiletries, stuff like that. Also, I use my home as a, as a safe place for, for the youth. And um, I actually built a, an enclosed deck in the, on my, <laughs> uh, Chris knows what I'm talking about. She's my next door neighbor. So, <laughs> so I was able to build, a, I did an enclosed uh, patio deck, you know, uh, 22 by 16. And I have a stove in there. I have, a bunch of chairs, uh, you know, so we made it kind of homey for them to come in, you know, just to chill out, relax. Um, you know, I got Nintendo Switch, I got Xbox at the house, um, you know, board games, uh, card games, uh, you know, and I have all the drums and we, we, we do drumming and uh, singing and, and all that stuff as well as, uh, uh, so uh, Chris knows she she hears us sometimes when we sing and um, in the summertime and springtime I set up the teepee um, so if they need to um, come and uh, you know just to go start a fire in the teepee and be by themselves I let them do that um, sometimes if they need to to camp in the teepee I let them stay in there you know um, I always have uh, you know, foamies in the house in case, you know, something is going on at home and they're not safe, they, they come and they stay at the house. So, um, you know, that's, um, kinship to me is very valuable. Um, and a lot of these youth are like family. I, you know, I've adopted them traditionally as, you know, my family and, that uh, I'll look after them in a time of need, right? And so that's um, how I create a safe place. Um, you know, I, I even went and bought a, a motor home and it's, you know, if some youth need a, a safe place to stay, they, they, they stay there, you know, it's, it's something that um, I want to be able to, to help and make sure that, you know, um, kids are safe and uh, because we don't have you know a transitional home up here we don't have a boarding home here and um, you know it's it's a much needed play thing that we need um, so my home is like um, everyone that i work with you know or the youth or my family my door is always open and uh and that's just how I was raised by my mother. It was, you know, to to keep that uh, that home open for for anyone in, in need. So I think I'm done here. I'll, I'll I'll pass it on to Adrian. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I think. The, like yeah safe spaces are like a crucial component of of ensuring that you do have that constructive environment just to, to grow develop like know themselves um but yes in the context of uh of the programs you do here at, at truly alive it's it's we found we've had to strike this balance right because uh you can imagine like safe spaces is a place where you feel free and open uh, enough to speak your mind but also that that right is balanced with that responsibility of being sensitive enough to your to your neighbors, your peers, um, and to maybe moderate your, your speech or your your opinions in such a way as to um, be as sensitive and be as kind as possible. And so that's that's a I think that's a hard kind of um, like concept that that concept of that balance is a hard thing to to communicate. And so you know, uh, given that our uh, and central to our work is um, being like cultural liaisons, um, links between cultures and, and um, different ethnicities and, and religions and stuff. Um, 
that's like another layer of challenge. And so I also, what we've done in the culture we've tried to foster is to um, have empathy really at, this, at the center of it. Um, because it's almost like spurring that, that, that journey of self-learning that, okay, um, it's not about being extreme or like overly kind to almost a fault to everybody. It's about having just that, that, um, that nuance and sensitivity to, to know that, um, yeah, that this space, uh, demands a kind of, uh, extra layer of thinking. And so I'll speak to one of our programs called Youth Unplugged. And so this is one where we really um, try to um, really highlight and emphasize this value. So um, it's basically a, a conversation circle where uh, we talk about uh, different social issues. And so um, at the heart of it is we want to be able to teach you the, the art of debate and disagreement, but to make sure that's facilitated in a constructive way, because it's very easy, especially when passions are involved and young people are very passionate. To, to have things seem personal or to have things be in a certain way that strays from the things we're talking about. Um, and so just seeing around the world, kind of that art disrespect, our respect for disagreeing is something that we kind of fall into the wayside. And so, yes, so having a safe space with, with empathy and with, that, um, with that, that way of thinking that emphasizes balance has been um, key to us. Um, I, I'll, I'll say, uh, has Mariah gone yet? No, nope, not yet. Thank you so much for that. Uh, when I'm talking about safe spaces or when I reflect on safe spaces for the youth that I'm working with, I think the biggest barrier, the, the first thing that I try to recognize and acknowledge is that the RCMP isn't necessarily a safe place or seen as a safe place for many of the youth that I'm working with. Historically, we've, we've created and continue to cause harm in communities. And, um, you know, the institution that I work for is not always seen as that safe place. So it's really important for me to acknowledge that when going into communities, going into places, working with individuals and youth, and taking the time and effort to build relationships. That's a huge piece for me in creating those safe places. Um, often that comes with, you know, bringing food and meeting over food. Um, and, you know, allowing the individuals that I'm working with, youth especially, to see me beyond the institution that I work for. And then slowly over time, introducing them to other members of uh, the detachment that I'm working in and bringing them in an opportunity to, to meet on an individual level. And that has been a huge piece of um, creating those safe spaces. Obviously, meeting people where they're at, meeting the youth where they're at, regardless of whether or not they've had any involvement with us in a formal capacity or not, um, seeing them beyond, um, you know, maybe what they've done or who they've associated with and recognizing all of their strength, uh, being warm and welcoming and making the opportunity to get to know them and to understand them and their needs and trying to keeping it as lighthearted as possible. The world has been pretty heavy for a lot of us, all of us really, over the last couple of years and creating a space where Everyone feels welcome. Everyone is recognized regardless of their, their gender, their identity, their sexuality, um, you know, and acknowledging that everyone is doing the best they can right now and just creating that space that is warm, welcoming and inviting and with food. That's a huge piece for me. I find the kids come if you bring food and it's such a great way to um, meet them where they're at culturally as well. And, you know, it takes the pressure off because everyone's eating and having a good time. And I will pass to Chris. Thank you. Um, I agree completely. Food is definitely a comfort for anyone. Um, and it really brings the youth together. Um, I think it's also a cultural thing to, to share um, meals with each other and to kind of share some things that you like about yourself or anything else, just to share your thoughts and ideas. Um, but creating a safe space for me, I think, first of all, I wanted to imagine what it was like as a teenager and those people in my life, like what they did um, to make me feel safe and comfortable. And part of that was allowing me to um, 
like lead uh, to be able to lead. So I felt really empowered in those situations. So providing that for youth um, is really important for me. So letting them kind of lead a conversation or letting them lead um, in questions too. So that is safe. Um, uh, also kind of addressing things as they come. And um, one of the things that I learned, and it was through SAS Prevention Institute, um, a wonderful person named Donna Banak, who kind of carried me under a wing when I first started and um, provided me this training where you, um, when you're creating a safe space for youth, you're building a community with them. So part of that is allowing them to decide what are the rules in that community? What are, um, what's okay to be talked about and what's not okay? What's okay to share in the group and what's, um, you know, what's their comfort level? So I think that that's really important in creating the safe space for them um, is just letting them decide, you know, letting them have choices. And that's really important. So um, I think all of us have answered this question. So I'll leave, leave it there. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, again, as always, any final words, final thoughts before we move on? Okay. So the question number four that I have, um, is there any sort of cultural component with your youth work? And if so, sort of what is it and how do youth respond to it? So for example, smudging, different ceremonies, anything like that. Um, and maybe for this one, I will start with Mariah. Thank you for that. Um, I am currently in Treaty 6 territory. Previously, I was in uh, Treaty 10 territory. And uh, culture is a huge piece of the work um, and the communities that I'm working in. However, as a settler person, it isn't necessarily something that I specifically bring to the table but certainly ensure that I am aware and kept up to date or, uh, you know, have a knowledge of the cultural practices and traditions. Um, having worked in a vast majority of communities, um, the Denny people that I worked with in the far north and the cultures and traditions there are certainly not always the same as the Cree community that I'm in now. Um, in saying that though, uh, ensuring that we have elders present and knowledge keepers present when we're doing the work so they can bring that component in a way that is, you know, uh, relevant um, and, you know, safe and more appropriate than um, obviously something that I wouldn't be able to bring to the table. So um, they're always welcomed, they're always encouraged um, to, you know, share their, their culture, their experiences and bring those pieces to the table, but it isn't necessarily something that I bring. Um, rather something that I have someone else bring who it's more appropriate for them to do so. And I will pass it over to Shane. Uh, thank you, Mara, for, for sharing. Um, so yeah, um, the culture component that I work with uh, with the youth is, uh, um, you know, we do uh, practice a lot of, uh, you know, indigenous practices um, such as smudging and ceremonies. Um, so when I was in the school, we would smudge every morning. Uh, sometimes we do a morning song. Um, we'd always uh, find dates when uh, we'd pick dates to go into to different ceremonies such as like sweat lodges or um, you know and other lodges that uh, I can't uh, really talk about but uh, um, we also go to like um, traditional powwows um, traditional round dances but due to the pandemic we haven't really been able to uh, travel anywhere um, but um, you know in La Ronge, um, uh, we're, uh, you know, trying to get the youth to, to take the lead on, on uh, reclaiming their, their identity, um, you know, such as, uh, you know, uh, practicing our, our belief system. Um, so, uh, I, I, 
I practice, you know, with the kids uh, whenever possible. Um, we do uh, women teachings and uh, young men teachings, you know, learning to be a scapios, um, you know, and, and learning to the rites of passages of our, our culture, right? And, and um, you know, moving them forward from, you know, being a, a young child to, to being a young man or a young woman and, you know, learning to respect one another and, um, you know, with all those uh, teachings that come with it, right, uh, with those rites of passages. And um, so that's what uh, connects, you know, the youth in our community. They they, they want to learn more. They want to continue practicing. They, it's something that empowers them, right? And, um, so, yeah, it's, it's something that uh, we meet, you know, once or twice a week and we do singings and, uh, you know, we, 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 we talk about uh, different things. We do sharing circles, um, you know, to, to alleviate anything that uh, is on the youth's mind or if they're going through a hard time. Um, so that's all, you know, uh, voluntary for me for, for after work hours and stuff. And, um, you know, it, it's something that uh, has helped me through my addictions and, uh, and my mental health uh, because I am a recovering addict and alcoholic. And, um, you know, I was incarcerated and I was uh, at a young age and I was in and out of the system growing up. and. You know, um, even being homeless, you know, at a young age is, was, was tough for, for me. And, and I know what these kids go through on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's why I encourage them to, to practice, you know, our, 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 our ceremonial beliefs. And, um, you know, and, and it's, it's what's helping them, you know, to be being able to, to even to, to pray and, um, you know, through singing and, um, being able to, uh, you know, to teach them that, you know, there are different beliefs out there and that we respect all ways of life and uh, we don't discriminate one another for each other's beliefs and that uh, we have to be very respectful when we do go to uh, different communities or if we see certain elders, you know, um, we have to have that respect, that mutual respect for, for our knowledge keepers, our elders, you know, and for our um, people that are living in our communities as well. So, so yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> I could go on and on, but I'll, I'll pass it on to uh, uh, Akela. I'm just looking at maybe who hasn't spoken about this one yet. Um, Natalia, I don't think we've heard from you on this one, hey? Thanks. There's definitely a cultural component to um, the show project just because it specifically is targeting um, trans and two-spirit youth, like really specifically. And I think actually it's got a big long, the project has a really big long title. Um, and I believe that culturally relevant is one of the um, words that's in the program title. So it's certainly something that is um, of concern for us when we're offering this project. I'd say that the cultural piece tends to come from um, maybe a little bit more of a contemporary approach as opposed to some of the traditional stuff. Um, just in the ways that we incorporate um, other two-spirit people or projects or information. So um, we've had opportunities to um, have people come in and do some beating um, with the young people um, in the project. We've done um, some art with like local two-spirit artists, um, spoken with um, another artist who um, was originally from Saskatchewan, but is living out in Ontario. So just about some of their work. Um, and when the youth offer projects or programs or whatever it might be in the community, um, we also try to, you know, encourage them to pursue whatever they would like to do. Um, but one of the things that we've done over the last few years um, is a event around Valentine's Day, which has looked a little bit different, obviously, over the last couple of years, but it was called Sagagito Muskiki, 
um, which means love medicine in Cree. Um, so just finding ways for them to kind of embrace those elements of their own identity. Um, and I think that that's been really beneficial. Lots of our program participants are Indigenous, um, just because it's targeting Two-Spirit youth specifically, um, but lots of them aren't. And so I think that that's also been a really fun kind of an engaging opportunity for all of them to share their experiences, share their background, um, share some pieces of their culture, and is also a way for us to make this programming more relevant. Um, one of the things that I hadn't mentioned is that an offshoot of the SHOUT project is that we got some additional funding from PHAC to do a syphilis campaign. Um, and the syphilis campaign was supposed to target hard to reach youth really specifically. So we had lots of conversations kind of just about like, and with the youth advisory team, because they were the ones that were kind of the geniuses behind the campaign. We had lots of conversations about like, what does positive representation look like in a campaign that's about something like sexual health? Because we know that historically, um, specific groups or populations have been targeted in those kind of advertisements, but in a way that stereotypes them. Um, and so we worked really hard to kind of come up with um, representation that felt positive um, and engaging and relevant to them. And I think that that um, piece of making sure that all of their different identities were represented was one way that we were able to do that. Um, Out Saskatoon also has a two-spirit um, round dance and feast that typically happens in the um, winter just before Christmas around AIDS Awareness Week, but uh, we haven't been able to do that for the past couple of years. So I think that some of the things, especially because this is a five-year project, um, some of the We've been to do the last two years have certainly been impacted um, by the pandemic, unfortunately. And I'm not great at paying attention. Did everybody get a chance to speak on that one? Who did we miss? You? Go, go ahead, Chris. Sorry. <laughs> um, it, I'll leave this short and sweet just because I know, like, I want to be mindful of time. I know we've We've only got maybe about 20 minutes and still a few more questions to go through. So um, yes, there is, an, there is a cultural component and um, we, I'm in Treaty 6 territory, I'm Woodland Cree um, and I live on reserve as well. And I grew up on reserve. Um, and so I try bring in as much as I can recall in my, in my upbringing. Um, but part of my work in decolonizing myself as well is learning the language. So try sneak that in as much as I can. Um, and they are currently in the Esquises Club. Esquises actually means girl. Um, but in Esquises Club, they are, they smudge every um, chance they can. Um, and it's more of a, an optional thing, which is really good because there's certain protocol around that, especially if somebody's maybe on their cycle so that's um something that they have conversations about too which is really good so definitely there is a cultural component um in terms of working with youth um i just want adrian did we hear from you on this one i'm also kind of losing track questions are kind of blending together yeah so I'll, i haven't gotten yet um, okay i'd love to speak just very briefly um we yes so we are a uh, multiculturalism is at the heart of our organization and so definitely there's <clears throat> there are cultural components um indigenous practices is something we we like to highlight and to, to emphasize just in general to everyone because um especially to to the folks that have just got here very recently one thing i noticed is that um you know a lot of the the, the bias that colonial mindset um hasn't really sunk in yet with with newcomers that have just arrived here so there's a lot of there's a lot less on learning that has that has to be done and there's a lot more just like natural curiosity too um this so like i, I have my my aunt just moved here just asked her from the philippines just a few months ago and we you know took a trip to the to wanuska and um center here in saskatoon and so there was just like um i guess a lot of things that i maybe took for granted about, about that's really fascinating about the culture just by living here for a long time was just like completely new and, and, uh, and amazing for for a newcomer but yes so um one other thing we we like to do in june is just, we have a multiculturalism festival that we 
we host we've been hosting it online the past couple of years but in that we take a take a uh, great, great lengths to ensure that youth are front and center of those festivities and ambassadors there um i think far and away a lot better than uh than adults that kind of being that ambassador just because of that natural enthusiasm um that yeah uh this really speaks for itself uh so that's all i have to say thank you Awesome. Um, I'm just being mindful of the time here um, because we're getting close to the end. I'm just going to skip ahead a few questions um, just because this one is talking about inclusive spaces, which we kind of talked about with safe spaces, I think. Um, challenges, we've talked a lot about challenges. Um, I may be just curious as to what are some of the challenges that you face as a facilitator when working with youth and sort of how do you deal with these challenges? How do you maybe overcome them? Um, and maybe we'll start with Chris. Thank you. Um, so one of the challenges in facilitating, I did kind of briefly talk about this, is that when I began my role, it was like at the cusp of a lockdown. So um, really just trying to navigate this, the pandemic and, and trying to develop programs um, or even activities within programs that were online that had previously been exclusively in person. So trying to um, move these in-person activities to a virtual space was, it was fun to do, very challenging, um, but I learned how to make a lot of different packages and, and do a lot of contactless drop-offs and um, a lot of FaceTimes, a lot of texting, a lot of, you know, virtual connections. So it was it was really challenging to navigate that, especially when there's a lot of work that goes into that. And then you're also doing, you know, your normal day to day job. So while doing that and then adding a huge learning curve um, was really challenging. So not recognizing um, signs of burnout was really huge. So I had to like take a step back and say, okay, you know, how much space do I need away from virtual right now? Because it's just, it's a lot. So um, really recognizing my own capacity, first of all, um, was a challenge. And then um, giving myself permission to, to take a moment and just breathe and say, you know what, I'm learning too, and I'm trying to do the best that I can, and that's okay. Um, and trying to really put myself in the shoes of these kids who are like navigating this world without any support. So I had, you know, uh, massive amounts of support, people I could reach out to when I was struggling or frustrated or um, not sure how to do something. I knew that there was people I could reach out to to do those things um, to kind of help me navigate that. And so I think just putting myself in the position of these youth was um, really what kind of helped me work through that because I had support and I had people I could, I could connect with. Um, so yeah, that was pretty challenging. Um, and I will just throw it to Mariah. Hey, thank you. Um, some of the challenges that I face when working with youth is just the unpredictability of, of where things are going to go or what maybe is going to be said. Um, very quickly, you know, someone shares something that, you know, really requires a lot more support um, than maybe what you were anticipating. Um, they can, it can be pretty heavy too, you know, when you start to build relationships with youth and, and they start to feel comfortable, you know, and you create those safe spaces that we've talked about, you know, they really start to open up and um, kind of carrying that vicarious trauma or needing somewhere to debrief or having a plan to debrief is something uh, that I think is really important when we're facilitating. Um, facilitating can be quite exhausting as well, especially if you're doing it on a regular basis. Um, even when you're doing it from behind a screen, it might seem easy to, you know, sit at home and maybe you're in your pajama pants and you're sitting on your couch, but um, it is, you're always turned on and you're always engaged and you're active listening when you're facilitating. So um, it can be quite tiring as well. So I think um, one of the challenges or the way that I've navigated it is um, not over committing myself, ensuring that I have time and space to debrief, that I have time and space between sessions to reflect or to be able to provide support 
uh, depending on what is going to come up, especially when we're, we're doing education and topics that are highly sensitive. So sexual assault awareness and consent, um, violence in relationships, uh, those are pretty heavy topics for our youth as well as our facilitators. Um, so just being mindful of giving yourself time and permission and the space to kind of promote resilience and recovery after, after those conversations as well. And I will pass it off to Adrian. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think, um, yes, yeah, so as, as far as challenges, and again, um, from, from the pandemic perspective, which is the, my entire experience, it's been um, not so much uh, getting the, that interest and engagement to start, because I, I feel like a lot of youth are, um, I guess I like feel very gung-ho about about you know the programs that we do and there's not that excitement at the initial stages but it's in the maintaining interest and maintaining uh, continuous uh, continuous engagement that that gets challenging so like at the moment um, we are running a, a series of free tutoring programs here at, at our organization and so um, you know youth youth can come in and get um, help with their homework and, it, and for the core subjects that they learn in school, um, there's teachers over there uh, going over the core concepts, making sure they do better at, uh, at the subjects when you take them in school. Um, and so even, even if it's something, you know, um, uh, when, when, I reach, when I reach out to young people and they, and they sign up, it makes a lot of sense because yes, um, they do need to get their grades up and they do need uh, that extra support, but, um, it's kind of when kind of the, the grind of day-to-day -day life starts to hit, you know, they have, they have sports practice, they have, some of them have like take music lessons um, and uh, everybody wants to have a social life too, you know? And so it's uh, on, on the one hand, um, as the facilitator, um, like we think that, yes, this program is, is good for their well-being. Um, so we try to make that extra effort to get them to, to come and to kind of see, okay, maybe if you uh, are trying to help them find solutions to their to their constraints so that they can attend. But um, I guess like speaking more as like, you know, I, I'm 24, you know, I'm, I'm not that much older from, from the high school. I still very much empathize and feel uh, that uh, what they're going through. And I can see why they feel they feel burned out and that why they won't feel as engaged to continue with these things. And so, so yeah, definitely maintaining that engagement has been has been the biggest challenge. Um, and uh, has, um, I wonder if Shane has gotten it. Thanks, Adrian. Um, what are some challenges that I face uh, as a facilitator when I'm working with youth? Um, I guess for me, it, it's, uh, like being attached, I guess, um, to the kids. And, um, you know, I, I gotta remind myself that, uh, and, and get reminded that, you know, that, uh, that I can't help, help any, everyone. And, um, you know, and the elders also tell me that I do have to step it up, but I also have to be, um, careful as well so that I don't burn myself out um, because uh, you know every day I, I wake up and you know I remind myself like I need to help someone today you know I need to, to do my job as as a community member and as a big brother you know and that uh, I gotta you know keep going forward with with the stuff that I'm doing. Um, so those are some challenges that that I have, I guess. Um, but when I when I do facilitating for camps or for um, different things like, um, you know, like the sharing circles, uh, you know, I'm very um, like I'm not uh, afraid to um, 
you know, call people out or to to intervene or you know or to to talk about uh, certain subjects that would be touchy, you know, with the kids or with with other people, you know, because I'm very open about you know my sexual abuse and uh, my abuse growing up and. Um, you know, I'm very open with, you know, my, my past addictions and, um, you know, being able to talk to the kids about that is, is, uh, is very, it opens them up as well. So, um, that's kind of like how I break the ice with the kids and, um, even new kids that do come, you know, we connect right away. Um, but, you know, um, yeah, so I guess that's those are some of the challenges that I face, I guess. And as a facilitator, um, sometimes we don't have, uh, you know, food or, you know, just stuff like that is, is sometimes some challenges that we, 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 we face at the house or um, when we do meet is, you know, um, but yeah, so uh, that's, that's it for me. So yeah. Um, I'll pass it on to, I guess, did Nikayla share yet or? Yeah, I'm kind of looking too. I think we've been doing this for so long that I'm kind of losing track of who's spoken and who hasn't. Um, Natalia, have we heard from you on this one? No, I was just going to say, oh, pick me. Um, I think that I'm just going to reiterate some of what Mariah was also sharing just in terms, and I think everyone's sharing just in terms of burnout. Um, like one of my biggest challenges, especially over the last year and a bit, is just that I'm often over it. Um, and sitting in front of a screen for whatever, six, seven hours a day is just exhausting. And um, in some capacities like yeah you're on when you're with youth um i like to think of i don't like to think of myself as a performer but i sometimes find myself performing um in order to be engaging and it's really hard to keep that up for three hours um when you're just staring at that little green dot so um, i think that that's kind of been one of the biggest challenges when we're in person hanging out with the youth like it's a lot easier i can spend an hour making chili or whatever to feed them and you know there's other things going on to um keep them engaged and they can like interact with one another and sometimes sitting in front of the screen just feels um, really prescribed as well so um i think that that's one of the things that i've um really been experienced as a challenge Nikayla, i'm maybe going to steal your job here because i saw that there was a question in the q a that kind of spoke to that um someone asking if um leaders or supports um are met how let me read the whole question. Um, how are your leaders or supports managing specific to mental health and personal vocation balance? Um, I think I'm very fortunate to work at an organization um, that really values its employees um, and also our ability to keep ourselves um, healthy and safe and sane. So um, from a management perspective, I've never really felt any kind of pressure to um, achieve specific goals or outcomes or um, put any pressure on the youth participants that we work with. So I've been very fortunate from that perspective to have a lot of space to just make the decisions that are going to be best for myself and best for um, the youth. I'm also just really um, fortunate to work with a team. The Shout Project um, at any given moment has usually four different um, facilitators or staff members kind of involved. So we're also able to rely on each other to kind of spread that workload out to make sure that um, none of us are overburdened or getting burnt out, whatever it might be. Okay. Um... I've completely lost track of who's spoken and who hasn't. So if there is anyone else who hasn't spoken about this question or the question that was posed in the Q&A about how your leaders or supports are managing specific to mental health and personal vocation balance, feel free to just unmute yourself, just go for it. We're coming down to the last couple minutes here. So, or any even final thoughts, last words, anything. I will go ahead. Um, I, I wanna say, I think we all spoke, but, I did want to kind of go off on um, 
the question that was asked about yeah managing specific mental health and personal vocational balance I think you know with having an organization that um like working with an organization that is a part of trying to support and help people who are in vulnerable situations already know that their workers are in a position of you know vulnerability as well because they're they're in that field because they want to help right like they you know people don't just go into helping roles because it pays well because you and I and everybody knows that that's not the case um so I think that management is mindful of that and they I know with where I work they I have six paid mental health days um and if I ever feel like I just need a mental health day and I just need to take a moment to regenerate myself I have freedom to do that and that's really powerful so when you have organizations um who understand that that's that's really important because you're in this role to help people you want to um empower people and that takes a lot of work so I think that that's really important to have. Thank you, Chris. So we are five minutes to lunch hour. So I just want to uh, thank my co-host, uh, Michaela, for leading those discussions on the panelists. And I want to uh, acknowledge everybody on the panel board for sharing their perspectives and their uh, capacities when, and roles when working with youth. So round of applause to all of you for giving that amazing feedback. Um, I had taken a lot of notes and just looking at the different, uh, you know, roles and the projects and the barriers and the challenges that I see that I heard from all of you and how we can um, work collectively and collaboratively with one another to ensure that youth are getting the right treatments and that our youth are being inclusive in our discussions when working with young people and making sure that we you know we have that space created for them and also to find different solutions as we all you know are tied down by the, um, the COVID-19 restrictions and ways that we can engage virtually uh, in, in, in to ensure our own safety and also to reflect on the question being asked of um, the you know as facilitators and as frontline workers you know that uh, we are making sure that we are taking care of ourselves during these difficult times too as well uh, self uh, self care is very well needed um, so I like to acknowledge that so we do have a video that we wanted to share but unfortunately due to time um, we cannot share that video uh, on this set network. Uh, so uh, I was given special permission from Shane Bird uh, to uh, share it with each and one of you. And he, there is a disclaimer. So once you receive or wanted to see the video, you are not advised to share it externally. So you are just uh, meant to watch the video. So the video is based on the, the, the youth involvement and engagement and uh, the different activities and projects they have been doing up in Northern Saskatchewan in the community of LaRange. So I'm just going to quickly put that in the shared box. As you can see, the link takes you directly to that video. So if you do want to ask questions about uh, that video, Shane can um, copy uh, for, for him, Shane to put his email into the chat box for you guys to reach out to him as well. So once again, if you guys have any questions from our attendees, uh, please answer them now. Oh, I can see a couple of more. So thank you all for your dedication and passion for this work. It's tough and energizing at the same time. Keep emotionally and physically safe. And that is coming from Carol Kurt, Ministry of Health, Government of Saskatchewan. And I appreciate the sensitivity, Shane. I will not be sharing. Thank you so much from that feedback, uh, Carol Kurt from the Ministry of Health, Government of Saskatchewan. So any last minute questions? I know we have a couple of minutes left. And So Shane has dropped his email in the Dropbox, as well as for our other panelists, if you need to reach out to them, uh, I qu I'll quickly ask each of the panelists to share their emails into the chat box and they can be copied and pasted uh, from our attendees. Okay, Natalie, thank you. I will leave this webinar running until about five minutes afternoon, just for some of you to uh, to um, to copy and paste those emails, and just making sure that everybody's getting that that content.
So it is almost closing. So once again, Marcy Choke, it was a great morning of really good discussion and engagement and learning as well. So thank you all for joining us on our youth engagement panelists and the health and uh, related issues within our capacities across the province. So thank you all and take care and uh, talk soon. And thank you to our panelists.